And Bob's handing out a handout that we're going to look at here a little bit later in the message. And uh, also a little gospel track that you uh, can take with you and share with others. So uh, <clears throat> give a moment for those to get out. And while they're distributing those, if you would take your Bibles and turn with me to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 verses 26 through 40. And the message tonight is entitled, Sharing Your Faith, Whether You're Gifted or Not. Sharing Your Faith, Whether You're Gifted or Not. Now, let me just say, that title is a bit of a loaded statement. Because, as Christians, it's not a matter of whether you're gifted in evangelism or not. Because, in Scripture, there is no spiritual gift of evangelism. Evangelism is always a command. And so sometimes people will say, well, I just can't share the gospel because I don't have that gift, and I don't either. The only way that I have gotten to the place where I am now in evangelism is the fact that I do it. And that's the real challenge there is to get out there and do evangelism so that you can become better at it. So <clears throat> Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. I know some folks have mentioned and asked how that we do how do we do the ministry that we do how do we go to places like new orleans or to columbia or kentucky derby that's another one that's on the calendar coming up in may uh how do we do that it is because of the prayers and the support of god's people that we can do that so we operate under ministry 501c3 ministry called ministry of unification our ministry is called Giving Others Eternity, but they provide the financial accountability for our ministry, and they allow us to raise funds through their 501c3 so that we can do this ministry that God's called us to do. And aside from the trips and stuff, you know, we have regular ministry that we do around the Raleigh-Durham area. Uh, we are on the campus of UNC Chapel Hill, pretty regular, NC State. And I mentioned the other night about the bus station in downtown Raleigh. Uh, so the support that people give enabled me to be able to do that kind of ministry. And we definitely appreciate people's prayers. That's probably the number one thing that enables us to do what God's called us to do. But tonight, at the end of the service, I've got a little brochure up here that talks about our ministry. If you'd like to pick one of those up, uh, they're up here at the front, and I'd love to share that with you just to tell you a little bit more about how our 501c3 ministry operates. Okay? All right. Well, I'll tell you, I had a tough time singing that hymn, Bob. I'm glad there wasn't but one hymn because uh, I ate way too much. So I told Bruce, I said, the boss man's barbecue legacy is safe. You know, Uncle Kelly always cooked the barbecue, and he's passed that recipe down to the family, and Bruce is uh, inherited that. He's doing a really good job with that, and so I'm so thankful that uh, that's not going to pass on, that that's still there for us. All right, if you are able, please stand as we honor the reading of God's Word. Acts 8, verses 26 through 40. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up with him and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this, and you'll forgive me, my Bible pages are sticking together. He says, Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shears is silent. So he opens not his mouth. In humiliation, justice was denied him. And who can describe his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, 
does the prophet say this about himself or somebody else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, What? Said, Here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus and passed through. He preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Let's go together to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're thankful that we have this time. Once again, to come together tonight, we realize that it is the last night of the services, but we trust and pray that it will definitely not be the last night of revival. We pray and believe that you've been at work here this week. We've seen that, and God, we just want to hold on to that. We don't want to let it go. We don't want to just go back to the way things were, Lord. We want to be changed, and we want to carry that revival spirit forward as we go into this year, and I pray that you will help us to do that. I thank you for your Holy Spirit and His presence here as we have had these services, as we have sang and praised you, as the Word has been preached and we pray we have truly experienced His presence with us. And Lord, now as we, pretend, we prepare to look at this passage, I just pray that you will help us to see that sharing the gospel with someone is not such a scary thing. It's not such a difficult thing. If we just follow a few principles and we trust in your spirit to lead and guide us, you can use us to touch our neighbors, to touch our family, to touch our friends with the good news of Jesus Christ. It all takes a step of faith to go out there and do that. And so God, I'm praying tonight that you'll use this message to equip and to encourage. And we pray all that in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that I'll decrease so that he will increase. Amen. All right, you may be seated. So in the Our Daily Bread devotional, Dennis DeHaan tells this story about a man who was assigned to the middle seat on an airplane. And he was kind of tired. He wanted to kind of rest a little bit, maybe try to catch a little nap. But he became irritated when this little girl beside him began to ask him questions. And the first question was this, Mr., do you brush your teeth? And he says, yes, I do. And she says, that's good because people who don't lose their teeth. And then a little later, he says, she says, Mr., do you smoke? And he says, no, I don't. She says, that's good because people who do die. And then after a long silence, she turned to the man and she said, Mr., do you love Jesus? And he said, yes, in fact, I surely do. And she said, well, that's good because people who do go to heaven. And so he thought he was going to have time to rest and catch a break and she was not going to ask him any more questions. But then she turns to him and says, Mr., can you ask the man over there whether he brushes his teeth or not? You know what happened next, right? <laughs> And so sure enough, he asked the man, do you love Jesus? And the man says, well, I don't quite understand what you're asking. So they spent the next hour talking about eternal matters and about salvation. You know, sometimes we need to be nudged a little bit to share our faith. Sometimes we need to be encouraged. And truly, this is one story that shows that. Um, and so we need to be aware of the opportunities that are around us to share the gospel. And I truly believe that if we are looking for those kinds of opportunities, God will send them our way. I had a friend that I went to Bible study with on Friday mornings, and he used to tell people that when he got up in the morning, he believed that there was someone that he was supposed to talk to about Jesus. And so he talked to everybody until he found that one person. That's good, right? That's a good policy. If you're looking for those opportunities, they'll come. It's kind of like this. If you leave here tonight and you start looking for a white SUV, guess what? You're going to see white SUVs all around you, everywhere. 
So my question is, who are you talking to about Jesus? Who are you witnessing to? Are you looking for those opportunities to share? Sometimes, again, we need a little encouragement. We need to be nudged. The story today tells us of how one of the first deacons, Philip, was guided and directed to share the gospel with a man from Ethiopia. And it was not just any man. This man was actually someone who was high up in the Ethiopian government. The Bible says he was in charge of her treasure, and so he was the treasurer. He was a part of the queen's cabinet. And so in this encounter, we see a great example of how to share the good news with lost people. Many times, preachers like myself were guilty of preaching on messages that uh, exhort people to share the gospel, but we don't always take the time to equip people. And so as I mentioned last night, that is why I like to follow up a message like the one last night with a message like this one that gives you some real practical advice on how to share your faith. And so tonight we're going to look at five steps that will help you share your faith with other people. Five steps will help you share your faith with other people. Step one, locate a center. Now, let me just say that's the easiest thing that I'm going to teach you tonight because they're everywhere. They're all around you. When you go to work, there are people there who need Jesus. You probably have neighbors who don't know the Lord and need Jesus. You probably bump into them at the food line over here in Murfreesboro or at the pizza place. You may even have them come knock on your door. Saturday morning, you know those people that come dressed up real nice and they want to talk to you about the Bible? Yeah, don't let them in your house because they don't believe in the Jesus of the Bible. Okay? So they're everywhere. All we have to do is look for them. Kind of reminds me of the story of a man named Joe who wanted to buy a coon dog because he loved the coon hunt. And so he went to this man's house who trained coon dogs and the man said, well, I've got a very special coon dog for you. You see, this coon dog has a talent that he can tell you how many coons are up in the tree when you take him out there hunting. And the man says, wait a minute, I don't believe that. How is that even possible? He says, all right, I tell you what, you come back later on, we'll go out, we'll go coon hunting, we'll see. And so sure enough, they went out later and they turned the dog loose. And after about five, ten minutes... The dog started baying, and so they went over there to the tree where he was, and they said, all right, what, how many coons are up there in the tree? And the dog scratched on the ground twice. man says there's two coons up in the tree. So he shined his light up there. Sure enough, there were two coons. Well, the other man said, I, I don't believe this. This is not possible. He says, all right, let's do it again. So he turned the dog loose again. Uh, about ten minutes later, the dog started baying. They went over to where the dog was. And the trainer says, all right, boy, how many coons are up in the tree? He's pawed on the ground three times. The man says, there's three coons up in that tree. And so he says, I'll take him. I'll, I'll buy that dog. And so he went home, took the dog home, and the next night he was so excited about going out and hunting with his brand new coon dog. He turned him loose, and after about ten minutes, the dog started baying. And so he went over there to where the dog was. And uh, he said, all right, boy, how many Coons are up in that tree. All of a sudden, the dog just started barking like crazy and foaming at the mouth, and the dog picked up a stick in his mouth, and he was just shaking it all over the place. And the man said, something ain't right with this dog. And so he says, I'm going to go back and get a refund. So he went back the next day to the man. He says, look, I want my money back. This dog don't do what it's supposed to do. The man says, well, what did he do? And he told him that he picked up a stick and started shaking it in the air. And the trainer says, look, man, you just don't understand. He was trying to tell you there are more coons up in that tree than you can shake a stick at. <laughs> there's more coons out there's more uh, lost people out there than you can shake a stick at. One of the issues we have with as believers though is we tend to kind of isolate ourselves from the outside world, from the lost. We kind of hunker down in our holy huddle in our Christian bunkers and we don't necessarily hang out with lost people during the week. 
I heard Pastor Johnny Hunt say this one time, and it's always stuck with me. He said, the older we get as Christians, the further we move away from those for whom Jesus died. Think about that. As we get older in our faith, we seem to have less and less friends who don't know Christ. We just replace them with church friends. And there's nothing wrong with having church friends, but how are you going to reach lost people if you don't know lost people? Jesus didn't do that. We saw last night where the Bible said Jesus ate with sinners and tax collectors. So don't be like the deacon that I heard about. This is a true story. The pastor was talking to the deacons one night about sharing their faith. And one of the deacons said, well, I don't know that I know any lost people. And then he says, well, wait a minute. There was that one guy. But when I found out he was lost, I didn't have anything else to do with him anymore. That's not how we should be when it comes to engaging people who don't know Christ. We need to make friends for Jesus. So you've got to locate a center. The next thing is this. You've got to listen to the Holy Spirit. Philip was led by the Holy Spirit of God. Look what it says, verse 5 in chapter 8. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And then in verse 26, Now the angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And then a little later, verse 29, the Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join his chariot. And then in verse 39, And when, this, he, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. So each step of the way, Philip was following the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I believe that the Holy Spirit can guide and direct you to those who need Jesus. And He can and will give you what you need to say. I know that because I've seen it happen. I'll never forget years ago, we were up in Indianapolis, Indiana. We were doing an outreach in an inner city neighborhood. And we were kind of going around. We ended up in a Kroger parking lot. And there was a man sitting in an old Chevrolet van with his wife. And so I started engaging the man with the gospel, and as I was talking to him, I just felt like the Holy Spirit was impressing upon me that I needed to go around to the other side where the wife was. And so I did that, and when I did that, they opened the van door, and there they were, his children sitting in the back. And you know what? The Lord allowed me to lead all four of them to Jesus. It was all because of the Spirit's guidance. What does it say in Luke chapter 21? Verses 12 through 15. The context of this, by the way, is the times in which persecution come and we as Christians will be persecuted. But Jesus said this. He said, before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to synagogues and prison, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. And then it says, settle it therefore in your minds not to meditate beforehand how to answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom with which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. So that just tells us right there that the Lord will give us what we need to say in the time that we need to say it. He will call to mind those scriptures that we need to share with somebody. Realizing that this scripture again refers to those who are persecuted, I truly believe that the Lord can give us those words when we talk to people about the Lord. John 14, 26, it says, The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So the Spirit of God will bring to mind the scriptures and the words that you need when it comes to witnessing. So that begs the question, how does one recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit? How does one know that the Holy Spirit is speaking to our hearts? Well, let me tell you the number one thing you need to do. You need to spend time in this book. Because this is God's Word. God moved upon the heart of man through the Holy Spirit to record this so that you and I could know Him. 
And the more you study and meditate on the Word of God, the more easily you will recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit speaks in a still small voice. It's interesting. If you think back to 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9-12, through 12, right after Elijah had gone up against the prophets of Baal, and King, uh, Queen Jezebel threatened to kill him, the Bible says Elijah fled, and he ran. He, he was scared to death. This man who had already defeated 450 prophets of Baal was scared of this queen. The Bible says he ended up in a cave, and he had a little pity party there. And so God spoke to him. First of all, there was a big wind. And the Bible says that the Lord was not in the wind. There was an earthquake. And again, the Lord was not in the earthquake. There was a fire. Maybe a wildfire. I don't know. The Lord was not in the fire. But then there was a still small voice speaking to him. Nowhere in Scripture do we see God shouting at His people. It's always a still, small voice. Also, the Spirit is never going to tell you anything that's contrary to the Word of God. So if you hear something in your spirit and it goes against what the book says, that ain't from the Lord. That's from the enemy. And then finally, we see in John chapter 10, verse 27, My sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you're one of His sheep, and you hear the voice of the shepherd. I'm told that each flock could recognize the voice of their shepherd from the other shepherds. So that's fascinating. You could take all the flocks and combine them together. And, and they did that. They did that at night. They brought them all together. But in the morning, the shepherd would come and he would call for his flock. And they would come. They would separate themselves from the other sheep. You know, when, you're, when you belong to Jesus, you'll hear his voice. And you'll follow him when he says, come. And so we've got to rely on the Holy Spirit when it comes. To share in the gospel. That's, that's the work of the Spirit, my friends. Telling people about Jesus is His work. Then we need to look to the Scriptures. Notice in verses 30 through 35, I believe the Lord was already at work in the heart of this Ethiopian. Why do you say that, Daryl? Because he was reading from the book of Isaiah when Philip found him. He was reading from the scroll. In those days, the scriptures were recorded on a scroll that rolled up. And so he was reading the word when Isaiah, I mean when Philip found him. My friends, the scriptures are the believer's sole authority for faith and practice. Some unknown writer summed up the purpose of the Bible. And he wrote this statement. This book is the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom for sinners. And the happiness of believers, its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, its decisions are immutable. What does it say in Psalm 19, verse 7? The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. You see, I've had people object to using God's Word, the Bible, when you witness to people. They'll say something like this. Well, they don't believe the Bible. So why would you want to use the Bible? Well, let me just say, their belief about the Bible does not validate the Bible or invalidate the Bible. Because it is God's Word. And so we don't need to fear using the Scripture because that verse right there tells us that the Lord uses the law to convert the hearts. The Lord uses the Word. And so if you leave out the Bible in your witnessing, you have no power. You have no authority. If we remove the Scriptures, we remove the means through which God works to convert people. Because the Bible says, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. Philip was directed by the Spirit to go up to the chariot and he could hear that this eunuch was reading the Bible. 
Because in that day it was very common for you, when you're reading the Bible, to read it out loud. And Philip asked him a question. He says, do you understand what you're reading? That right there is a very powerful question. Because honestly, most people don't understand the Bible. Some Christians struggle with that. The eunuch said, how can I unless someone guides me? You see, the Bible is a spiritual book, and it must be read and understood with spiritual eyes. It says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. God is working through his servant Philip to explain the Scriptures, and the Holy Spirit opened this man's heart to understand. It takes the Word of God and the Spirit of God to do the work of God. Folks, I gave you a little handout. If you've got it, if you would look at it, husbands and wives, share one. But it's the Roman road to salvation. Let me just say, this was the first way that I learned to share the gospel after I came to know Christ. At age 24, after I graduated from college, I have some college friends back here. I bribed them not to say anything, okay? But this was the first way that I learned how to share the gospel. And every scripture here is found in the book of Romans. First of all, we need to understand the truth that everyone has sinned. And it says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have broken God's laws, and we do not live up to His standards. You ever lied before? You ever taken something that didn't belong to you regardless of the value? Jesus said if you look at a person with lust or sexual desire, you've committed adultery with that person already. You see, that's the law of God. And we've all broke it. I broke it. Brother Bob's broken. Sin carries a penalty. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God who is holy and just has prescribed eternal separation from him as the punishment for sin, and we cannot save ourselves. But God provided a solution, and that's the good news. The Bible says that God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God allowed his perfect son to be crucified as a sacrifice on our behalf. He died in our place, even though he never sinned. Jesus never sinned. He he never sinned, even though... Uh, God treated him as if he did. God treated him as if he was you and I on that cross. And then we have to repent of our sin and believe the gospel. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one one confesses and is saved. And then it says in verse 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You can use those verses to lead somebody to Jesus. And I've even put an example of the sinner's prayer down here. Now let me caution, it's not the prayer that saves a person. You can pray that prayer all day long. You can get dunked in the baptistry all day long and it's not going to save you. It's your faith in Jesus that saves you. God may use the prayer as an instrument to communicate your intention and your desire to Him, but it's all through Jesus. And then I put at the bottom, always follow up, regardless of a person's decision. If you use this to try to lead someone to the Lord and they come to faith, praise God. Get them plugged in here at Buckhorn Baptist Church. If they don't, call them a couple of days later. Hey, have you been thinking about what we talked about the other day? Real simple way to share the gospel. I also gave you a little track. This is more of an illustration. Got this little card here. It's the bridge. And it shows how God bridged the gap between man and himself through the cross. And the only way to come to God is through the cross, through our faith in what Jesus did on the cross. And you notice on the back there's scripture to go right along with the illustration. I used this at the bus station the other day with a a teenager. And he says, you know, I've never heard it explained that clearly before. And it was all because he had a visual picture of the gospel. And because the Holy Spirit was at work. 
the eunuch was reading from Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53 is one of the most wonderful chapters in the Bible because he looked down through the years and he saw Christ dying for your sin and for my sin. And he described that in there. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like sheep that before it shears is silent. So he opens not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And for his generation who considered that he was cut off and out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. Verse 35. The Bible says, Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And that's what it takes. We begin with the scripture and we tell them the good news about Jesus. It's that simple. You're saying, Daryl, I just don't get it. I don't think it's that simple. Yes, it is. One of the problems is we just don't try sometimes. We think, well, you know, they're not interested. Well, you know, I don't know what to say. Listen, did you get saved yourself? Hello, did you get saved yourself? Are you saved? Then you know the plan of salvation because someone shared it with you. So that ought to be enough. And we've just got to be bold enough to use it. You know, do you understand that even the Apostle Paul had to pray for boldness? Go look it up at the end of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6, I believe it's verse 19 or so. He asked for God to give him boldness so that he could share the gospel through the doors that were opening. Let me say, if Paul had to ask for boldness, we do too. <laughs> the man who wrote a majority of the New Testament needed to pray for boldness. My friend that I go to Bible study with, Jonathan Lotz, Jonathan Lotz is the grandson of Billy Graham. And Jonathan Lotz is also an evangelist. And people ask him, and I agree with this, people ask him, how are you, Jonathan, how do you, how do you so easily share the gospel? He says, I do it scared every time. I do it scared every time myself. <laughs> but I know the Holy Spirit is there. And I know the Word of God is active. And so the next thing is this. We need to let the Holy Spirit do His job. Philip and the eunuch were riding in the chariot. The Spirit of God was speaking to the heart of the eunuch. And it says, they came to water. And the eunuch asked, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? Now, if you have a newer translation of the Bible, you'll notice that it may leave out verse 37. There's a reason for that. There's a reason that it leaves it out is because some of the older manuscripts that are considered more reliable don't have that verse. And they put it in the footnote. But I believe it belongs in there because this is Philip's response in verse 37. Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's a profession of faith that was inspired by the work of the Holy Spirit. Got to let the Holy Spirit do His job. You can have the most clever argument for the reason why people need to trust Jesus and it will fall flat on its face if the Holy Spirit is not behind it. When we think about his baptism, we know that baptism is an outward witness of an internal change of heart by the Spirit of God. And so we're not baptized to be saved, but we are saved by faith and baptized because of our professed faith. I shared this scripture last night. I'm going to share it again. John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I'll raise him up on the last day. The idea again is enabling us to come to Christ. And we need to understand that the Holy Spirit is the one who works to enable men to come to Christ. In Titus 3, five, the Bible says, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing and regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Heart change comes through the Spirit's work. Even though God chooses us to share the message, we cannot save a single soul. God does that. 
God does that. And, and, and if you take credit for it, <laughs> God doesn't share His glory with anybody. We just get to be there when the fun happens. Such a wonderful experience when you get to see someone trust Christ. You get to see the life change that takes place in their heart as a result of meeting Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is our best friend when it comes to witnessing for Christ. He can speak in a way that to people that we cannot do. It says in John 16, 7 and 8, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I'll send him to you. And when he comes, it says three things. He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit convicts people of their sin. The Holy Spirit also convicts people of the fact that God is a righteous God, a holy God. And that if we don't turn from our sin, that we're going to stand before Him in judgment. And that's all the work of the Holy Spirit. You just got to let the Spirit do His job. And finally, we're about to land this plane, okay? We need to live to share Jesus wherever God calls us. Notice after... He baptized this Ethiopian eunuch. The Bible says that the Spirit of God ushered Philip away and he sent him to an area called Azotus. And then Philip continued to preach the gospel all the way to Caesarea. God didn't allow Philip to go back to the thriving ministry he had in Samaria because God was doing the work in Samaria. And Philip was there preaching and people were getting saved. And, and, but God said, no, i got other work for you to do i got other places for you to go. God has places for you to take the gospel. And let me just say, you'll probably be able to reach some people that I'll never be able to reach. Or your pastor will never be able to reach. Why? Because you come in contact with them all the time. I saw something disturbing today, Bob. I saw that less than a third of people have confidence in the integrity of pastors according to a survey. Yeah. So that tells me that we pastors need to do something to correct that. And that also tells me that they'll listen to you before they'll listen to me. The Great Commission, Jesus instructed us to go make disciples. And as we look at it, saying in the original language, it says, as you go. As you go. As you go about your... Daily life. Make disciples. That's the way the early church did it. The Bible says in Acts chapter 8 verse 4, after the persecution had broken loose in Jerusalem, those who were scattered went about preaching the word of God. Don't get hung up on that word preaching, okay? It just means they announced the good news. And when you leave here today, you're going to be scattered back out into the community, not because of persecution, but because that's simply the nature of church. We gather together to be equipped, to be encouraged, and we spread out to evangelize. That's the way God planned it. That's the way He set it up. So listen, we need to locate a center we need to listen to the Spirit. We need to look to the Scriptures and let the Holy Spirit do His work. And above all else, we need to live to share Jesus. Would you join me now as we go to the Lord in prayer? <clears throat> Father, tonight I pray that what I've shared here has been a real practical encouragement to your people. That it has helped them to see that, yes... They can share Jesus. They don't have to be an evangelist. They don't have to be a pastor or a deacon or a Sunday school teacher or any of those things. That they can simply step out in faith and obey you and share Jesus. And I pray that as a result of this message tonight, they'll do that. I know last night some folks were praying for lost friends and relatives, family members, uh, all that. I know they were praying. Many came to the altar to pray for them. And now my prayer is that they will 
step out and they'll witness to those people that they were praying to, praying for. That they will be bold. Give them boldness, Lord. Give them a boldness that they've never had before. Like I said earlier, Paul had to pray for boldness. We pray for boldness. We pray for your spirit to inhabit us and, and empower us and fill us and use us for your glory. Not for ours, but for yours. Not so that we could say, oh, ten people were baptized here at Buckhorn Baptist Church or any of that so that we can say, that you were at work in the hearts of the people. So God, we put all this in your hands, in this time of invitation. Lord, you continue to speak to the hearts as you have been. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, folks, one more time. Our hymn of the invitation is number 307, Just As I Am. And if God has spoke to your heart today, come. Pray for your friends. Pray for God to give you the boldness. If you need prayer for anything else, we're here to pray for you. Maybe you want us to help pray for a family member. I don't know. Uh, someone last night came and asked me to pray specifically for a family member that needed Christ. So if that's what God's telling you to do, you obey the Spirit and follow Him. Let's stand.